Hi, it's Chris Thompson here again. In September 2013, I released a video called Speed Kills Your Pocketbook, which showed how our speed enforcement was largely targeting safe drivers. In 2014, the BC government finished a speed review and actually increased speed limits in certain sections of BC highways. Since then, there's been an outcry to undo the speed limit progress. There's also been a pro-enforcement push centered around distracted driving, specifically cell phone use. And in this video, I want to show you how the misuse of statistics has resulted in an unnecessarily strict enforcement of speed limits and cell phone use. And I want to start with the news clip that pissed me off enough to do this video. The latest numbers given to Global News show that in 2016, after the limit was raised, there were 159 crashes, an increase of 23%. First, if you took three minutes to look online at the average speed data from the BC government, you'll see that 2015, 2016, and 2017 had a lower average speed than every year in the previous 10 that we have data for. So you can't categorically blame this on speed. Second, get the rest of the data. We asked the ministry, and 32 minutes later, I kid you not, this is the graph they sent us. The year ends are slightly different, but here's Global's 23% increase, which ignores the 11% drop, and the fact that three of the four years during and after they raised the limits were the safest years in the last decade. And don't worry, we'll see this guy later. And if that makes you mad, buckle up. Because this is only one of the ways that people lie with statistics. Three disclaimers. First, I work with SenseBC. And contrary to what some may believe, we are not trying to get people to drive faster or use cell phones while driving. We think the safe travel speeds of the reasonable majority of drivers should be legal and traffic fines should be justifiable. Second, of the news stories I pick on in this video, most of them are from Global BC, but that's just because they've done the most transportation stories. Certainly CTV had its moments. Well, when does a stop sign not mean stop? Never. It's a stop sign. But I like Global. I've been on it a lot. And I think, by and large, they do a pretty decent job. Just sometimes, you need to question things a little more. Third, lying with statistics doesn't necessarily mean lying. It means using numbers to justify what the numbers don't justify. Because driving, generally, is incredibly safe. Listen to Stephen Dubner and Steve Levitt, the writers of Freakonomics. What comes to mind risk-wise when I say the following things? Something almost everybody does every day, driving your car. Incredibly low. Uh, that uh, if, if nothing were to kill you except driving your car, and all you did was drive your car day and night, day and night, day and night, you'd expect to live for 250 years. What that means is that if instead of writing Piano Sonata number 16 in C, Mozart became a cab driver, he'd statistically still be alive today, assuming, of course, that his car hadn't broken down. I told you to buckle up. And most of us just get in our cars and go on our way. What country is this car from? It no longer exists. The overwhelming majority of the time, we're fine. Put it in H! Some days we have near misses. Ah! Idiot! And very, very rarely, something goes seriously wrong. And the number of things going seriously wrong, at least on a province-wide scale, is based on probability. And I'd like to start by showing you how roads that are getting safer over time can still have crash rate increases. In 2016, there were around 300 traffic deaths in BC, which had a population of about 4.6 million. So let's say your odds of dying on the road are 1 in 10,000, because it's a round number and not everyone drives. Now, let's model a population of a million people, because on my computer that's where Excel runs out of numbers, start in an imaginary 1950 and make it 1% safer each year. So, this perfectly straight line represents the expected number of annual fatalities. In other words, how dangerous it is to drive. But that's not how random chance works. When Excel rolls the electronic 10,000-sided dice, we get something a lot more complicated. When I get Excel to re-roll all these dice, the general trend is always downwards, averaging around our theoretical line, but there are some huge short-term increases, a lot over 40 or 50 percent, and some more than 100 percent. But we know that each and every year is safer than the previous year because more people are, I don't know, let's say driving indestructible Volvos. This is the only Volvo footage I had. So these increases are all just statistical noise that don't mean anything. People may look for otherwise traumatic events to blame. For example, Kenny G releases Songbird. People are still listening to Kenny G. 
and people are still listening to Kenny G, but these correlations are obviously meaningless. And by the way, for you Excel nerds out there, this spreadsheet was over 700 megabytes. I was proud of that one. So what does this mean? Well, it means that higher crash rates don't necessarily mean that things are more dangerous. Which brings me to the first way to lie with statistics, which is, for most of us, to talk about statistics. And here's why. It's really easy to go from Excel formula to graphs and say that these increases are just statistical noise. But in the real world, you have to figure out if things are getting more dangerous, and why, or if you're just having bad luck, and that's really, really hard to do, even with a statistics background. This brings me to the second way to lie, appealing to false authority. In other words, just because you're an expert on something doesn't mean everything you say is brilliant. Consider this. In 2016, this mix of engineers and doctors posted a criticism of the 2014 speed limit increases. Here's what they wrote. Deaths went up 17% and the collision rate went up 14%. This marked the first increase in collision rates after a 10-year declining trend. This number was from the June 2016 Rural Highway Safety and Speed Review on page 9, and if you'd have just flipped to the next page right there, you'd find that the percentage of serious collisions caused by people driving too fast dropped by 4% after the limits were raised, which is kind of the opposite of what you're implying. Second, Jeff Brubaker, an emergency medicine professor at UBC, compared ambulance dispatches for road trauma in BC after the speed limit increase with those before. After accounting for seasonal variations and long-term trends, he found that they went up 11% across the entire province during the six months following the implementation of the new speed limits. The BC government only raised speed limits on 1,300 kilometers of highways, which is 1.8% of the 71,000 kilometers of road in the entire province. But that didn't matter to these guys, and they were just warming up. A few years after speed limits on many BC highways were increased and there is growing concern, it was a bad idea. Now a new UBC study has renewed calls to roll back speed limits in places that saw the limit go up four years ago. Let's just reset. Let's get them back down to 110 and, and the other speed limits, the lower speed limits. We now have a full two years of data and now we're saying it is actually worse than we originally thought. Let's check the actual study. Hey, since BC got a shout out. Hi Jeff, hi Gordon. Yeah, I know it looks like I do hostage videos here. Anyway, let's start at actual speeds. This graph shows speed by season before and after the speed changes broken down by areas where the speed limits went up and where they didn't. What you see is that speeds went up more in the areas where the speed limit stayed the same. This undercuts the entire point of their study. So you may ask, how can smaller speed increases mean higher crash rates? Here's a hint. Driving conditions were so bad, an ambulance lost control and ended up upside down in the ditch. Bad weather. Here's the before and after crash map, and here's the snowfall level starting in 2014 for Kelowna, Hope, and Vancouver. And I couldn't find snow, so here's precipitation for Merritt and Lytton. Now, of course, they took speed and weather into account, right? Funny story. They had the speed data, but chose to ignore it, and didn't even mention the weather. I mean, what happened to the weather stats? Did you lose them and all that crap on the whiteboard behind you? And a Washington State University professor had a bunch of other technical issues with the study as well. So, Drs. Brubaker and Lovegrove, to distill my feedback into minimalist Swedish cartoon form, here is a universal set of instructions for what I think everyone should do with your study. But you certainly convinced our premier all three channels quoted him. The, the, the increase in fatalities in areas where the speed limits were increased uh, shocked me, quite frankly. And uh, we're going to take a good hard look at that. No, I really doubt that because less than a month later... We are all going to have to slow down a little bit on some BC highways as the NDP government reverses some of the higher speed limits brought in by the Liberals. A three-year review looked at 33 highway segments and it found serious collisions jumped overall by 11% in areas that saw a speed limit change four years ago. Here's the report. One of the most important points is buried in segment E.4 in Appendix 2. Road collisions are rare, random, and sporadic. The more severe collisions are even rarer and more sporadic. Hence, to have some significant results, the safety evaluation should include a large enough sample of locations where an intervention took place. As such, safety impacts by individual sites are not typically statistically significant and therefore are not discussed in this report. But that's exactly what happened. Somehow, speed limits only got rolled back on 15 of the sites. 
But in seven of the 15 segments, the speeds the ministry reported actually went down after they raised the limits in 2014. Here's the problem. The speed kills logic works like this. Higher limits lead to higher speeds, which lead to more crashes. But for the amount that speed, speed kills, kills is rammed down our throats, and the amount of cops that we see on the 6 o'clock news telling people to please slow down, you would expect to see clear and unambiguous correlations for both of these links. But we don't. In almost half of the 33 road segments in BC that were changed in 2014, speeds the ministry reported went down after the limits were raised. And in about a third, speeds went up and crashes went down. I think this link is vastly overrated. Now, let's talk about the next way people lie with statistics. Simplified or biased reporting. We saw news bias in the first story, and I don't know how many stories I've seen where, instead of intelligent interviews with experts, we see lazy street interviews like this. Asking these buskers what they thought of distracted drivers and they broke out in song. Why? Why would you ask the guy that thinks to himself, I need a chair and a musical instrument but can only afford one? I know the rebuttal is this. My opinions are as valid as the next man's. Yeah, all right, just come on down. No, they kind of aren't. Your opinion on something is worth however much you've studied it. All streeter interviews are good for is filling time or making people look stupid. Observe. Hi, I'm Governor Mike Huckabee of Arkansas, wanting to say congratulations, Canada, on preserving your national igloo. Thank you, Governor. This is the only proper way a streeter interview should work. Larry, what do you think about this policy of opening up Starbucks to non-customers? That it, it's really not an issue. Who cares? I don't understand why you're here or why people even care. No one in America cares about this. Now, you may just think that I'm some speed demon that's trying to blame the weather so I can drive faster, but if the media had done their job, you wouldn't have to take my word for it. On December 14th, 2018, ICBC wrote a letter to the BC Utilities Commission asking for an increase in rates. 160 pages in, in Appendix D.0.4, we found this. The last two quarters of fiscal loss year 2016-2017 are excluded from the model because adverse winter weather in this period results in an elevated number of crash claims, which could introduce a bias to the forecast if this period was included in the model without appropriate adjustments. And remember this guy? ICBC's 2016-2017 years are these two bars. I don't get it. Everyone seems to be blaming speed limits without taking a good look at plausible alternatives. But, to be fair, I did find a safety initiative so stupid that the media finally second-guessed it. And here's another creative tool to drive home the message about slowing down. BCAA and Preventable temporarily installing a 3D optical illusion called Pavement Patty. The idea is, as drivers approach the image, a child appears to pop up and run across the street. A visual cue to take extra care and adhere to the speed limit. Isn't it possible that might just confuse people? That is true. Yeah, no shit. You're teaching people to either run over children or cross a double solid yellow in a school zone. All right, method number four, reliance on ordinal rankings. In other words, worst, second worst, third best, etc. If I were to tell you, and this is true, Saskatchewan was the second deadliest province for scuba diving in 2009, you'd wonder, what happened in Saskatchewan in 2009? Did hunger win out over common sense? You'd probably, at the very least, think it's dangerous to dive in Saskatchewan, as well as pointless. But you would be wrong about the dangerous part. Nobody died diving in Saskatchewan in 2009, but only saying it was the second worst made you think that it was actually bad. You can't just give people part of the story. Now, cue British Columbia. Uh, those who are uh, using uh, uh, cell phones or texting while driving, distracted driving, because the reality is it kills more people now than uh, those who are driving while impaired. Yeah, but that is a meaningless statement without context. If you look at how distracted driving became a worse problem than impaired driving, you'll realize that it's because fatalities due to impaired driving decreased faster than fatalities due to distracted driving, which have also decreased, especially when you consider the BC population increased 10% over the period in this graph, and cell phone usage went up 50% over that same time, which means that distracted driving is much less of a problem than you're implying. And this difference is three people. More people have died in BC scuba diving. For comparison, the following video is actually more informative than Farnworth's comments. <coughs> this
This is one of my central frustrations with transportation policy. Distracted driving fines are skyrocketing because fewer people are getting killed by drunk drivers. This makes no sense to me. David Eby, you're up. Some of the stats uh, we have received indicate that distracted driving may be a worse problem than impaired driving. And this statistical lie is being used to push this agenda. The province is looking into the possibility of nullifying your auto insurance if you're involved in a crash because of distracted driving. It would be similar to penalties for drunk driving and street racing. So to treat distracted driving as different than impaired driving uh, seems strange. Now, I think this is a terrible idea, especially since... A judge has ruled you can get a distracted driving ticket for just having your phone in your hand. And more especially since... Questions are being raised about whether or not a cell phone resting in a car's cup holder constitutes distracted driving. I have to say, voiding your insurance by touching your phone, or even not touching your phone... Face down in the cup holder... ...would be more painful than watching this guy. <laughs> Again, I don't think screwing around on your phone while driving should be legal. But if you want to charge someone $2,000 for being next to their phone, your narrative should be a little bit better than that. And the last and worst way to lie with statistics is to just make shit up. Here's an easy one. First, though, speed kills is a message we have heard for years. And whether or not you believe it, maybe the experience of a crash expert will convince you. In my opinion, it comes right back down to how fast that vehicle is going. If you don't want to believe a collision reconstructionist, try arguing with math. If a vehicle is going 80 kilometers an hour, it will take it a distance of 31.5 meters to come to a complete stop. I'll argue with math. That's wrong. Observe. Here are cones every 5 meters and one at 31 and a half. First run from 80? Just under 20 meters. You're off by a factor of a fully grown Tyrannosaurus Rex. Second run? 22 meters. If a guy in a 14 year old sedan with almost 300,000 kilometers on it can stop at around 20 meters while releasing a giant cloud of whatever that was, where did this number come from? Did that comp just yank it out of his 50 year old textbook? My turn with math. If you're basing ticketing on stopping distance, does this mean I'm allowed to do 95 in an 80 zone? Maybe even 31 and a half meters in the winter. Nope. What about on a Fiat? Nope. I asked the reporter where he got these numbers, and to his credit, he answered basically right away saying that they're from a blog post by the reconstructionist guy. Look at where stopping from 100 kilometers an hour takes about 50 meters and hold that thought. A car that takes 90 horsepower to go from a dead start to 60 miles per hour in 20 seconds can stop in 4 seconds, but it takes 450 horsepower in the brakes. 60 miles an hour is about 100 kilometers an hour, and stopping in 4 seconds takes a distance of about 54 meters. So, according to McCowan and anyone else that uses these numbers, braking performance has improved less than 10% since 1935. He goes on. Now add in a person's average two second reaction time and that distance jumps to 76 meters. Also way wrong. We tested that too. First, Randy from SenseBC sat behind me with a clapboard that I couldn't see. My foot is on the gas and when he claps, I hit the brakes. The average of 12 tries was 0.27 seconds. Then we tried to mimic the perception, decision and execution timing that you'd need if something weird happened on the road. Randy's going to read a randomized list of celebrity names to me. And if they're male, I hit the brakes. If they're female, I hit the horn. Also known as fraternity rules. Time starts when Randy finishes the first name. This didn't quite work out how I thought, so I'll just take my slowest reaction time. Just under 0.5 seconds. And I only screwed one up. Steven Tyler. Oh fuck, I fucked that one up. I stand by my honk. Time for more math. Let's take the same 76 meter stopping distance calculation from Sergeant Bruce McCowan, substitute my braking performance and reaction time, and figure out my safe speed in his 80 zone. Here's my reaction distance, and here's my stopping distance. We'll rearrange this, and you all wondered in high school when the hell you would ever have to solve a quadratic equation in real life, and here you are. So according to the math of, uh, what was it? Leave a collision reconstructionist. Right. Someone with my tires and reaction time could safely do 146 kilometers an hour in an 80 zone on a dry day and stop in 76 meters. But this would normally get you an excessive speeding ticket, your car impounded, and a free shout out on the 6 o'clock news. 
Using the more conservative numbers, Bruce McCowan's safe speed goes down to 134 kilometers an hour in an 80 zone, which would still get you a shout out on the six o'clock news. Driver doing 134 kilometers an hour. That is 54 kilometers over the speed limit. And look, my 0.5 second reaction time is within the range in this textbook from 1957 that starts at 0.4 seconds. And they also say a reasonable reaction time is just over three quarters of a second. So the logical conclusion of, again, the numbers of Sergeant Bruce McCowan, the guy in charge of the Ridge Meadows Traffic Services section of the RCMP, is that the police are ticketing and impounding cars of at least some people who are driving safely. And I'll let Stephen Colbert describe this. There is no English word for that. The closest is the German Klausterfuken. Now, Sergeant McCowan, if you and others like you are out there treating drivers like we all have the stopping distance and reaction time of someone driving a fully loaded dump truck while, let's say, daydreaming, we're not going to respect your narrative. And there's still one story that's even worse. A Richmond company says its freedom of information request has revealed far fewer deaths due to drivers using cell phones behind the wheel than officials claim. You'll see one officer here, a West Van Corporal, now retired, who at the time asked himself, what was he doing here, really? We've been told as, as police, it's cell phones. And that's not fact-based. No one's died as a result of sitting at an intersection looking at their cell phone and putting it down. It's the people that are physically talking. But even the people that are physically talking or texting while they're driving, the stats say two a year on average since 2010. Not the huge numbers that ICBC is, is telling us. Hang on a sec, can I ask something? Who the fuck is this poor guy? He's in the b-roll of almost every global story on distracted driving. Here's what's happening. Distracted driving is a problem in BC. Cell phone related fatalities are a tiny part of the problem, but a huge part of the ticketing. So why the huge enforcement blitz for these two people? It's because it's so, so easy and drivers have money. 50 times the number of people are murdered in BC every year, but I've never heard people yelling to raise the fines or seen any kind of automated stab camera. Anyway, back to making shit up. But the point here is, Far too much effort is focusing on cell phones when clearly there are many other more dangerous distractions. What? It's the media broadcasting the effort. You're the one that got a guitarist and a dude slapping his footstool to sing about the dangers of talking on a cell phone while driving. Bill Maher said it best. That's not news. No, it's not. Look, I'll admit it. I love driving and I take pride in my vehicle. I've driven north of the Arctic Circle on four wheels and all the way to Signal Hill, Newfoundland on two which, by the way, took me past this wonderful Canadian town. Though now, I spend most of my time on these two wheels. And I take pride in my accident-free driving record. And I exceed the speed limit a lot of the time. We all do. And here's what I want you to take away from this video. Millions of people driving safely every day is not newsworthy. And that means they have to squeeze drama out of whatever they can. So, take statistical news stories with a huge grain of salt, because a lot of the time they're biased towards sensationalism. If the news allocated their time proportionally among all the different things that would kill you, a typical news hour would only have about 19 seconds to talk about transportation. But concern, controversy, and outrage sell commercials much better than my honest newscast. Good evening, I'm Chris Thompson. Our top story, the world today is safer than it's ever been in almost every respect. In transportation news, if you'd like to go out for a drive and you pay attention and don't do anything stupid, you'll almost certainly be fine. In the weather, the world is slowly getting warmer and we should all be concerned a little bit more. In sports, the sports team from your particular geographic region sucks, but you should all be concerned a little bit less. I'm Chris Thompson. Thank you and good night.